So again, thank you very much for your attendance today. We have a wonderful talk ahead of us. And Mary Evelyn, I invite you to introduce our speaker. Thank you. First, I want to draw attention to T. Mullen's beautiful banner here. Isn't that lovely? Thank you, T. Beautiful. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that Teilhard made it not rain today. Are you aware of that? <laughs> Thank you, Teilhard. <laughs> Quite amazing. <laughs> Quite wonderful. Um, I wanted to just say one thing before we uh, introduce our speaker, and I'm thrilled we have Ilya today, and so many of you have come from far and wide to hear her. Um, and that is that in the fall, we are going to be doing MOOCs, which is massive open online classes at Yale on Journey of the Universe, two six-week courses on the film and the book and the conversations. These are free, open to the public, as my brother says, anyone, anywhere on the planet. So that's a Teardian vision that we hope will continue to reach more and more people. It will also have a course on Thomas Berry with the Thomas Berry website and his lectures um, and so on. So I think in addition to what John just said, we had a wonderful board meeting. If in the future you want to listen to the board meeting, you're welcome to join us. It's 10 to 12, but it, the work that's being done um, by so many people in education and the arts and music and, and so on. It's quite wonderful. So I want to give that, that shout out to the work that is being done. Um, now, we are thrilled that Orbis Books is here and uh, Jim Keen in the back has uh, done a wonderful job and I mentioned one book series on ecology and justice and there's flyers in the back on that. But I wanted to mention very specially as the beginning of an introduction to Ilya, a new book series from Orbis Books on Catholicity in an Evolving Universe, which will bring this message, this message of Teilhard, but also of Thomas Berry and of many of you here in the room who've been birthing this. We are all midwives to quite an extraordinary vision of a sacred evolving universe, of a divine milieu. And Ilya has been doing wonderful work in, in publishing these books, in lecturing across the country, around the world. Um, for many years she was teaching at Georgetown, uh, and now she's moved to Villanova to their theology department. She's broadening them, she's giving them a sense of what the world needs to hear, what the students want to hear, but what so many of you as well have come to listen to. So, Ilya, I think, um, is unique in, I would say, bridging the world of this cosmic vision, this cosmological unfolding of the universe, back into the Catholic tradition, which has, in many ways, um, forgotten or left behind that we're not just a 2,000-year-old tradition. We're a 14-billion-year-old <laughs> living tradition. And that has been a great gift because she's able to put this vision into language that people understand, namely a language where God is mentioned or Christ is mentioned. And I would say this is a wonderful compliment because the work that we're doing, we don't necessarily mention God. We don't even mention Christ. But it is completely behind, you know, journey of the universe, this unfolding universe, because we're trying to appeal to a world where that language might not connect, you see? It's, it's a world, the spiritual, not religious, you might say, and so on. But this is why the importance of Ilya's work is, uh, needs to be held up, because many people, in religious communities or not, want to hear this message in language that they have committed to. Some of them committed their lives to, the nuns and, and priests and so on. So this is a unique contribution of rebirthing the cosmological vision of Teilhard into the world, especially the world of, of religious force, of religious presence, of religious language. And even this Christ in evolution, 
Um, and the unbearable wholeness of being, God, evolution, and the power of love. And that's the other thing that Ilya brings forward, I think, so beautifully, that we're all seeking love. We are all seeking intimacy. We are all seeking relationship. And to bring that with this sense that it comes right out of the cosmos is a tremendous gift it's regrounding us, recentering us, taking us away from the alienation that the modern world uh, spins around us. All of these are gifts of Ilya's language, Ilya's journey, and we're so delighted to have her here today. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, I put in the wrong password, hold on. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Uh, it is really an honor and a privilege to be here at Union Theological Seminary, a place I've known for years and some very fine theologians have walked these halls and passed through these doors. Um, my topic today is on Teilhard and world religions. Ultra-Catholic or ultra-human? Uh, and the reason I, um, I, focus, I want to focus on this topic today is because, you know, there has been some ambivalence uh, with regard to Teilhard and uh, especially Eastern religions. So I'd like to maybe focus in on that today. And what did Teilhard think about Eastern religions or world religions? And where did he think all this was going? First of all, I want to say this. With regard to Teilhard, you must leave Earth for a moment and enter into the Apollo spacecraft. He is, he is looking at these phenomena of religion, spirituality, and humankind from a much wider perspective and a much larger perspective than I think most of us do on a daily level. He was a religious thinker, but really, when you come down to it, he was a scientist. And he wrote about religious things as a scientist. So I want to highlight that because, again, I think we sometimes interpret him as a religious or a theologian, you know, in the making. But he said himself, I never leave for an instant the realm of scientific observation. Elizabeth Sewell, in her book, The Human Metaphor, states that Teilhard's greatest contribution may be methodological. In other words, Teilhard, the scientist, the evolutionary biologist, approached the things of the earth and the things of, of religion by connecting cosmos with logos, you know, some kind of mediating principle of the divine. Science with eros. He was, he did things as a scientist that, you know, scientists would go, uh-uh, you know, we don't do those things, we don't even talk about those things. So how did Teilhard, you know, get to this point? Well, uh, you know, he lived for many years in China, more than 20 years, from 1923 to 1946. He traveled extensively throughout Asia and Africa. And yet, here's what's the amazing thing. Despite all those years in China, it's like he did not make an effort to learn about Eastern religions or their practices. It would be sort of like living in Chinatown and never having Chinese food, you know. And it makes you wonder, what was this lack of engagement with other religions? You know, was he just like this uber-Catholic, or did he really think that Catholicism was the be-all, end-all? And so here are my questions in this presentation. You know, did Teilhard think that mysticism could only be at home in a Christian theological framework? You know, was he sort of, did he have sort of a Western bias here? Did he maintain that other religions had to be Christianized if they were to have a role in evolution? Was he an uber Catholic, like an ultra Catholic, who failed to value the significance of other religious traditions? So, you know, you think if you're spending this much time in the East, wouldn't you really want to know who your neighbors are and what they're doing, you know, when they go to the temple? So here are my three 
theses, you know, because every good theologian has a thesis, right? So here it is. A, Teilhard did not view world religions as a religious scholar, but as an evolutionary scientist. So I hope you will keep that in mind. Second, Teilhard wrote as a pivotal figure within first axial period consciousness. Sometimes we tend to read back into Teilhard, right? So we're saying, how come he didn't, you know, how come he didn't go and learn about Eastern religions or learn their practices? Well, he didn't have internet. He didn't have air travel like we have today. So he really is sort of the, the product of, of the first axial period who anticipated global consciousness. Third is this, his insights in world religions and evolution are cosmic and not individual. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what is religion for Teilhard. Because for, for, for him, for this fantastic Jesuit thinker, he did not think about religion as personal salvation or like, you know, a me and Jesus in the cosmos thing. He has a much wider vision. His vision is really summed up in his own little creed. Um, and I even brought the little book, How I Believe. In fact, every, most of what I'm saying here, if, it, if it's not Teilhard, then it'll be Ursula King and then it, with me thrown on top. But anyway, <clears throat> this is what Teilhard says in How I Believe. I believe that the universe is in evolution. I believe that evolution proceeds toward spirit. I believe that spirit is fully realized in a form of personality. I believe that the supremely personal is the universal Christ. Now, you, might, you would take the universal Christ as, okay, Teilhard, we're with you right till the end, and then all of a sudden you become like this radical Christian. And that's where we're going to go today. What is this universal Christ, even as a symbol for Teilhard? So let's, let's, begin with the, let's begin with Teilhard. He is a scientist and a biologist. What does he do in his everyday life? As he gets up, gets a cup of coffee, he goes out to the desert and he digs, right? He's an evolutionary scientist. And that's why everything he's talking about with regard to religion is understood within the science of evolution. That, that process of unfolding life, both cosmological and biological, through the spheres of matter, life, and consciousness. And you know his famous insight. There's only one real evolution. One real evolution. The evolution of convergence. The evolution of synthesizing, coming together. He says, because this alone is positive and creative. And he says, this way of thinking, from what we understand from the natural world, applies to every dimension of life, no matter what we're talking about. Politics, economics, social forms. So here's evolution in the great process of convergence. You know, as Mary Evelyn and John have shown wonderfully the journey of the universe, 13.8 billion years, and here we are, you know, in 2016. What the heck are we doing here, right, you know? I mean, it's just unbelievable that there has been a process all along of things, you know, elements coming together, complexifying, forming deep in relationships, and consciousness rising. And Teilhard asked, well, what is it that keeps this whole kit and caboodle moving towards greater complexity and consciousness? So he speaks of a principle of wholeness in evolution that he calls omega, you know, which he will eventually identify with God. You know, there's this, there's this hole within the whole that's emerging, and that hole is also the goal. So this omega, God, is the whole in kindling the whole for, for Teilhard. So thinking about this process of cosmic evolution, biological evolution, we ask for Teilhard, well, what is religion in light of this, this process? And for Teilhard, it is this. Religion begins on the level of cosmos. Now, right there, we're like, huh? You know, are you kidding? Um, but Teilhard's saying is religion is not individual. It is cosmic. 
And he says the religious phenomena taken as a whole is simply the reaction of the universe and as such of collective consciousness and human action in the process of development. In other words, there's something about this whole cosmic process that is self-transcendent and unifying as it's moving towards greater unification. And that becomes expressed on the human level in terms of, you know, religion. But he says in his little essay, How I Believe, he says, religion is born of Earth's need for the disclosing of a God related and coextensive with not the individual person, but the whole of humankind. So for him, religion is so much larger than each, you know, each individual. And as Ursula King points out, Teilhard is one of the few modern thinkers on religion for whom evolution provides the dominant note of his entire work. With Teilhard, you cannot even talk about religion without beginning with evolution. So you cannot even separate these things. And um, it's this synthesis of religion and evolution. See, I told you, this was going to be no ordinary Saturday afternoon, okay? Right? You know, you got to widen, widen your vision here, right? This faith and the physical universe, not just me and Jesus or me and, you know, Allah or me and Om, um, it's just faith in this physical universe is key to the whole synthesis of how he sees world religions. He even states at one point that religion, are you ready for this, is biologically. So religion has a biological function. It's the counterpart, he says, to the release of Earth's spiritual energy. So Earth is not just, you know, just brute matter. Okay, we all kind of get that stuff. We're getting beyond Cartesian dualism. But the, uh, but Taylor is saying there's a spiritual energy of the Earth, and it's religious. And this religion, even on the human level, is born to animate and control this overflow of spirit. So in 1916, this is even before he got to China, he realizes that religion and evolution should not be confused nor divorced. You have to listen to his words. They are destined to form one single continuous organism in which their respective lives prolong, are dependent on, and complete one another without being identified or lost. Religion and evolution belong together. And it is for us, he says, to affect this synthesis. OMG, right? <laughs> so, you know, what, what is the purpose of religion? Teilhard did not think, you know, that I can be saved from a fallen world. Religion, he says, is to sustain and spur on the progress of life. It is to nurture within us the zest for life. Religion is that deep core energy, which is the energy of cosmic personalization. And on that note, that's where Teilhard says, no one religion, no one religion can satisfy the religious spirit of the earth. Because the, the core of religious energy is beyond world religions, it is cosmic energy. Now, on the level of humans, we do have religion emerging as self-transcendent you know, consciousness within di different cultures, within different parts of the world. And he says religion on the level of consciousness and human action is really what's important rather than the institutions or belief systems. He says the religions of the world represent the highest development of human consciousness in the direction of unification. Now, I hope you're with me, okay? Religion, evolution, big picture, core energy, the whole thing is about moving towards um, a personalizing universe because that's what nature does. It keeps coming together into synthesizing into greater unity. So he says, you know, look, world religions have existed for quite some time. Okay, we get that. But humanity on the whole has not defined its spiritual pole and thus lacks religion as a whole. Mm-hmm, 
Yep, Teilhard, there we are. He says, religion is stuck on the level of individuals and heaven. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, he says, today we are seeking a religion of collective humanity. I would put it in this way. We have sort of become stuck in first axial period consciousness and therefore first axial religions. We think it has always been this way, that it should always be this way, and we find ourselves pushing on the walls to get out because there's a core energy that's moving us towards, you know, our consciousness has shifted and, and we feel the need to move beyond these bounded walls of religions. I think part of the problem is all world religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism, have not dealt well with modern science. And I think that separation of science and religion has stifled, you might say, that core energy of religion to move forward. So this is what Teilhard says, the kind of religion we see cannot be found in the religious traditions of the past, which are linked to static categories. He says, we need a new religion full of dynamism and conquests, a religion that can utilize the free energy of the earth to build us into a greater, wow, unity. <laughs> Is that a note from Teilhard of some sort? Like, okay, we're moving along. So he says this, um, Teilhard's own words, any religion with, which focuses only on individuals he in heaven is insufficient. People are looking for a religion of humankind and of the earth, which gives meaning to human achievements, a religion that can kindle cosmic and human evolution and a deep sense of commitment to the earth. Does religion today kindle us for a deep commitment to the earth? Does it enkindle us a deep commitment to one another for a greater unity? I don't know which news report you look at, but it doesn't look that way to me most of the time. Teilhard says our God has become too small, too small to nourish us to go on living on a higher plane. We don't live in a static cosmos. I think we're getting that image now, thanks to Orbis Books, who keeps publishing these things, that we live in a cosmogenesis, right? It's a dynamic cosmos, not a static cosmos. And that means the whole structure of our religious thoughts and our beliefs must be modified. They must, in a sense, be changed according to how we know this cosmos to be. So he speaks about, Teilhard speaks about the biological function of religion is to give a form to the free psychic energy of the world. The purpose of religion is, in a sense, to harness this energy, to give it a form towards greater unification. So he spoke about two types of faith and two cosmic energies. He says there's faith in the world and there's faith in God. And Teilhard had a great love for this world. He said, even if I were to lose my religious faith, I would still keep my faith in the world. Um, and then with this faith in the world, he spoke about this energy of attraction, this tangential energy, being drawn, you know. Uh, but he also speaks about an energy of transcendence. So this faith in the world is what we are drawn to in our work, in our culture, in our desires to heal the earth. And then that faith in God is what pulls us up ahead. You know, what is that radial energy? So this new religion of the earth for Teilhard must have two dimensions, a radial dimension and a tangential dimension. Are we drawn together? What are we drawn together to? And what is drawing us forward? So it's like this, we can be drawn together, but if we have different, you know, religious absolutes drawing us not forward together, then we can't have a new religion of the earth, right? We have a little bit of a scattering and a thinning out. So, you know, I think Teilhard is asking, do religions empower evolution? That's the question here. Do religions, whether it's Christianity or world religions, do they empower us to synthesize, unify, and move forward in a new complex unity? Do they help us develop this world together? Do world religions you know, activate us within us a faith in God, an, an activating force, a force of attraction? So the litmus test for Teilhard on world religions is this, their evolutionary function. Do world religions empower us to evolve or not? 
I won't take a poll. It's okay. <laughs> so he moves on. You know, really, I often wonder what was going on in that desert in China. <laughs> I mean, his, his thoughts are just so wide. They're vast. They're, they're cosmic. They, they, it's like his mind could envelop the earth and the peoples of the earth. And, and he sees this, he says, we, the, you know, our world religions, you have to think of them within the process of evolution. It's a process of harmonization. We, we are in evolution, and our world religions are part of that spiritual energy. But he says what we need is, since now is a new religion of the earth. A new religion of the earth. And that means world religions must come together. Not just like a have a nice day together, you know, but we really need to learn about one another. Dialogue, it's huge, you know. I mean, a lot of what John is doing, you know, at uh, Yale. I mean, encounter one another, but not on spiritual spirit experience alone. It's not like, oh, that's who you pray to, this is who I pray to, we'll swap, you know, we'll swap prayer partners. It's rather, you know, do our paths of spirituality empower us together to maybe get involved politically, you know, and, and maybe aim for the best candidate that will help unify this world. If you know of one, let me know. Uh, maybe, you know, come together and help, you know, Put in public policies for global warming. World religions need to take an active part empowered by their various spiritualities. Why convergence? Um, and here, really, I give the hand to Ursula King, who's written, really, I think, the book on Teilhard and world religion and Eastern religions. And she says, convergence is the search for or the movement towards a common meeting point through which we can interrelate and create a unity that transcends our diverse particularities. Uh, and that means for Teilhard, convergence was not just like, what a lovely idea, I think we should get together, you know, and have lunch with like the Muslims or the Jews or the Buddhists. It's like convergence is a structural necessity for a higher evolution of humankind. Convergence of world religions is no longer an option. It is a mandate for our, our age. Um, and Teilhard thought, you know, listen, we, we cannot just simply compare doctrines. It's not going to work. These doctrines and, and rituals were all, you might say, emerged within different cultures, within different time periods. He says, what we must engage on is by way of mysticism and action. And for him, that meant contemplation and prayer by which we enter into communion with the source of all interior drive. What is that deep spiritual core within us, whatever your tradition is, and can we meet on the level of that core spirituality? So this kind of seeing together is a kind of convergence of spiritual energy together. And therefore, he thought that world religions should be not on the sidelines, you know, just sort of, um, you know, and that's where they are sometimes, you know, like the world is going on and religion is something that's sort of still privatized, tribalized, and marginalized. And Teilhard's like, no, this is the energy that should energize and activate in the building of the earth and in the development of human community. He thought this must be an integrated development that respects the earth and our total environment. And here's what he said, without religious convergence, we are left with unsatisfied theism, or maybe even unsatisfied atheism. And without religious convergence, Teilhard thought we are at the brick wall of evolutionary compression. Because the core energy of evolution, from his perspective, is spiritual energy, transcendent energy. And unless that energy converges, it dissipates, and we don't know where to go, and we find ourselves polarized and fragmentized. And therefore, the energy, uh, in a sense, stifles the Earth's energies. So we not, you know, we can't develop um, a sense of convergence of world religions in cultural isolation. We do need to come together and draw from these religious traditions. Now, here's the question of Teilhard. Well, how did he draw from the religious traditions? 
There is some, um, some, kind, some think that maybe Teilhard just outright rejected Eastern religions. So I want to say he tells us himself that he was attracted to Eastern religions, particularly uh, Buddhism, because of its pantheism um, and, and, uni and unitary uh, type of spirituality. So he said he, he realized he couldn't remain confined in his Christian beliefs. In his words, he had to plunge into the great river of religions into which the rivulet of my own private inquiries has just flowed. Plunge. So he plunged, uh, and then he realized, well, you know, it's true. I mean, I can't build up a type of new religion of the earth, you know, just based on Christianity. And he says, just as a scientist, I would never make some kind of conclusion just based on, you know, my science alone. I would have to know other sciences. So he says, I wouldn't be so foolish as to build up, you know, even uh, my own religious faith without having experienced the total of human experience and religious experience. He saw that all world religions, here's his thing, I want you to note this. He doesn't say, okay, time over, you know, everyone needs to wake up and move on. He thought that world religions do have spiritual attitudes and visions that are indispensable, irreplaceable, for the integrity of a total religious consciousness. He saw that Every religion has sort of an incommunicable core. Every religion has this kind of transcendent, it's, it's, it's being pulled or being, you know, um, yearning towards something. He says, contact with the supreme inexpressible which they preserve and pass on. So he saw a good, a positive to the world religions uh, because of this tradition and this deep core within them. He says, you know, the East fascinated him by its faith in the ultimate unity. Uh, he, the great appeal of Eastern religions is that they are supremely universalist and cosmic. Uh, and he even gave special note to the exuberant cosmic uh, unity in the plains of India. Thank you, Teilhard. Then he goes on to say, oh, oh, by the way, but this cosmic unity that really attracted me, he says, this really means for, you know, for this Indian Buddhism, uh, it means a suppression of the multiple, a rejection or denial of the material world. So he's like, oh yeah, I'm really drawn to you. Oh no, I really don't want to go your way. Uh, because he says, you know, all the quest for knowledge and personalization, he says, you know, in, in your strand of Buddhism, you know, or uh, he says, all earthly progress seems like diseases of the soul. Okay, he was a little hard there. Um, he says, matter seems like dead weight and illusion. So he looks at Eastern Buddhism as this kind of transcending materiality into spiritual unity. And he's like, wait a minute, you know, materiality is the stuff of religious spirit. Why would you want to transcend it? So he's drawn and disappointed. He's drawn by their uni unifying and pantheistic dimensions, and yet he's disappointed because Eastern religions seem to be world-denying, ahistorical. You know, they are not engaged with historicity. He says this kind of dichotomy of spirit and matter in the East leads to two moral systems, two metaphysics, two mysticisms. So he sees this kind of what in his view is a type of dualism emerging in the East. Was that a fair assessment? Well, I mean, he didn't go to any of their prayer rituals, so I don't know. You know, I mean, um, he kind of draws these, these largest conclusions. But he says... You know, these religions ultimately do not give form to the free psychic energy of the world. So he says, I thought I could discern God in the East. You know, I wouldn't say he gave it his best shot, but, you know, he did really uh, give consideration to the Eastern religions. But he says, it was clear that God awaited him at the other end of the horizon in these areas more recently open to human mysticism by the road of the West. So Teilhard forfeited the road of the East to turn toward the road of the West. Now, when he turned West, and that means turning back, and I can not say to monotheistic faiths, he never speaks about Judaism, and I have to tell you, he didn't give much credence to Islam. Like, it's a footnote. Uh, and he's like, basically, Islam is um, an unreconciled Judaism, and it's got to make up its mind if it wants to be with Christianity or with... I'm like, wow, okay, seriously, Teilhard, you could have done a little bit more there. But, um, 
you know, he, he turns back to the West, and that means turning back to Christianity. And he goes, guess what? I find pessimism in both East and West, he says. You know, there's pessimism among many Christians. You know, if the East has kind of a world-denying spirituality in his view, uh, Western Christians are not much better. You know, he says uh, Christianity had become outdated, irrelevant to the world, stuck in Aristotelian framework, uh, in a sense, unfamiliar un, uh, with modern science. Uh, and he says, Christianity has become like Eastern religions, acosmic in its abstract formulas, giving the impression of not believing in human progress. And this is what he wrote in Christianity and Evolution. He says, Catholicism disappointed me by its narrow representations of the world and its failure to understand the part played by matter. Oh, yeah. We haven't done too much better than, um, you know, what he felt. And so here's the thing. Teilhard really did believe not only in the materiality of the world, but in something, a principle, God, present. In other words, it's not materiality for its own sake. There's something driving it towards greater unity, greater consciousness. He thought Christianity could have the key to this. So he impels us or invites us to move from Christianity as an acosmic religion, you know, like cosmic denying, to a cosmic religion. And he says Christianity is compatible with the structural dynamics of evolution. Christianity is compatible with the structural dynamics, in other words, the dynamics of uh, convergence, the dynamics of unity, the dynamics of personalization. Uh, and that is true. I mean, today we are beginning to speak about Jesus as a cyborg. Now, we won't go down that path, but, you know, Jesus as cyborg because a cyborg is the symbol of hybridization. And Jesus is a hybrid of divinity and humanity. That's what Christianity is from the get-go. The whole thing is about synthesizing. And the whole thing is about personalizing. But he says, look, Christianity has got to get out of the Middle Ages. He says, Christ must be born again. He must be reincarnated in a world that has become too different from that in which he lived. So he says, we, we need to rediscover the Christ. It's time to return to a form of Christology which is more organic. That's a good name, organic Christology, and takes account of modern physics. A Christ who animates things, the whole range of things, the whole kit and caboodle, the earth, the planets, the galaxies, the whole nine yards. And so he looks to the scriptures, to Paul, to the writings of John, and basically, you know, I think in some ways, Teilhard rediscovers sort of a stoic, uh, a stoicism, the logos. You know, it's a logos Christology now writ across the vast expanse of a Big Bang universe. Everything, he says, is Christified, gathered up by this divinity that assimilates, transforms, and divinizes. So he speaks about evolution in light of Christianity as a process of cosmic personalization, a transhuman subjectivity. And here's what he thought. He thought that Christianity, by the very nature of its core foundation, incarnation, in the person of Jesus Christ, he thought, well, this religion reconciles in a single living act the all and the person. This is the religion of the future. Now, was he saying, you know, you Buddhists, you know, you, you Muslims, you, you, you know, what were you thinking? Like, this is the religion of the future. So we have to understand what does he mean by this? What is this universal Christ? Is this some sort of like ultra Catholicism? Like, finally, you know, I realized this is where we need to let go of everything you learned in the Baltimore Catechism, okay? You gotta, gotta just leave that for a moment, all right? And you need, to, you need to step on the airplane, the 747, and you need to fly high above. Because the Christ for Teilhard, the universal Christ, is not on the level of human religion. 
This is, not, this is not like, oh, everyone become Catholic and you'll all be saved. This is on the level of the cosmos. So he is saying at the heart of the Big Bang cosmos is divinity. And that divinity, united to create reality, has a third nature, organic, organic nature, and that whole complex is the Christ. So the Christ, in his words, are the synthesis uh, of Christ and universe, God and universe. Which means that any Christology for Teilhard will be about personalizing creativity and synthesis. Those are three terms, personalizing, creative, and synthesizing. We are not about sin, guilt, judgment, heaven, hell, and all that stuff. Uh, he is about a Christ who provides the role of religion in evolution. A Christ, in his words, which is the form. And what's the form? We can use the language of cosmic personalization. It's like the whole universe is one large person in the act of formation. Like the whole universe is like a maternal womb for the birthing of the cosmic person. And that's why he says these spiritual energies must be harnessed from the world's religions. We must dialogue together. We must participate together. And he says, look, we can even know if we're on the right track together if we realize that the comparative value of our creeds are, you know, have evolutive attraction. Do our creeds empower us to evolve? The I believe, you know, in, in one, the Father, the Almighty, Creator, Heaven and Earth. Does that empower us to be creative, synthesizing, personalizing? So, you know, Teilhard has got some critics. He said, you know, uh, uh, R.C. Zaner said, Teilhard never formed, you know, he formed ideas on Eastern mysticism, but he never read any of the basic text. He had no experience of their monastic or prayer life. Ewart Cousins, my beloved Ewart Cousins, who was my mentor, said, Teilhard did not enter deeply into Eastern religions by way of technical knowledge. He, did not, he didn't even learn the language of these religions, nor try to understand their rich, symbolic, and mythic religious systems. So I want to say, did this lack of religious experience, was this a Catholic bias? Was he locked into a Western perspective? Um, or... Would a deeper understanding of Eastern religions have even altered his vision? I want to say, ultimately, no, it would not. His vision is large. It's on the level of cosmos, and therefore his interest in world religions was not experiential. It really was scientific. It was the vision of a, of a biologist, an evolutionary person with a deep religious core. Um, his aim was not to, in a sense, you know, let's get beyond the old stuff. His aim was to integrate our religious experience into a new spirituality for a new earth. And the beginning of this integration is found in the rich traditions of the world religions. So here's what Teilhard, of, uh, you know, came to realize. Christianity is not normative of all religion. Christianity is normative of evolution. Oh, really? I mean, who talks like that? You know, who thinks like this? And in, in Teilhard's view, Christianity fulfills an essential function in evolution. And what is that function? Synthesis, personalization. And he goes, if we are to really retain in Christ the qualities on which its power in our worship are based, we have no better way to do so than to accept evolution. In other words, Christianity can really not be Christianity, the fullness of its core spirituality without waking up to evolution. So he speaks of a neo-humanism, looking to the future with a renewed Christianity now fit to this world. In his view, you know, Christianity has to break forth. It's got, it's got, it needs a new birth. It needs to breathe freely and spread its wings. A new philosophy, a new theology of a convergent whole. 
He thought that, you know, in a sense that this Christic, this Christification of the universe is by convergence of world religions, but Christianity must lead the way. In other words, our core foundation as Christians is not that exclusive to world religions. It is rather that we are to be the scientists. We are to be the, the plowers. We are to, in a sense, invite everyone into the party, so to speak, uh, harnessing these energies of love. So he says, belief in the risen Christ is not an obstacle to the encounter of world religions. This is the very means of encounter. In other words, we are to be the ones who um, are on our way to a transcultural consciousness, a transcultural encounter. So Teilhard the visionary, Teilhard the cosmic thinker, Teilhard the evolutionary thinker is thinking about religion not in terms of personal lines of salvation. He's thinking about religion in view of planetization. Planetization means gathering um, human mass and energy around, in his words, a maximal radiation of thought. Um, you know, at the United Nations in 1975, uh, it was declared there, uh, this is now 41 years ago, the crises of our times are challenging the world religions to release a new spiritual force transcending religious, cultural, and national boundaries into a new consciousness of the oneness of the human community, and thus putting into effect a spiritual dynamic toward the solutions of world problems. 1975, we affirm a new spirituality divested of insularity and directed toward a planetary consciousness. That is right out of Teilhard's thought. He thought that we cannot move towards a new socialization without a new spiritualization. The core energy of what we are must empower us for a new human community. You know that he lived uh, uh, at the dawn of the computer age, and he was really fascinated by the computer, right? And he talked about this emergence of a new level of consciousness that he called the newosphere, you know, the level of global mind. Um, but he also saw that that computer could unify us in a new way, but it can't do it alone. And here's where I find sometimes we live in this techno age and Google and Facebook, in a sense, uh, sort of taking over the terrain of spiritual energy and, you know, have plans for the earth, which is fine. But, you know, Teilhard said it, will, it really, you know, it, it can't work without that core energy. So, so technology can unite us, but it also can isolate us. It can unite us, but it can also create deeper levels of division. It depends how we control and use this technology in light of our spiritual needs and powers. What's missing from a techno age? A unified soul. Basically, Teilhard says, what is missing from this globalized earth is a unified soul. The more we become conscious of our immensity, the organicity of the world around us, the more we feel the need for a soul that makes itself felt, a soul capable of maintaining and directing this process of planetization. So what is the spiritual threads, you know, that can draw us together? That's what he sees. Our world religions are still too tribal, and our secular still remains opposed to the sacred. You know, what Teilhard thought, even in 1950, in a talk to the World Congress on Religions, he says, you know, our world religions, our various creeds, still provide everyone with an individual line of escape. And truthfully, at the end of the day, even in, still in our interreligious gatherings, we go away with our individual line of escapes. We do not find any room for a transformation of the whole into a new whole. And Teilhard says it's no longer just a religion of individual in heaven. We're looking for a religion now of humankind in earth. And he says without that religion of humankind in earth, we feel ourselves suffocating. And I think we can say that. We feel ourselves suffocating today. So his view is we are moving, and we have the capacity to move 
towards a new level of ultra-humanism. That's the deepening of, of, of humanity. In other words, we are in the process of harmonization. We are evolution made conscious of itself. And the only way we can move forward towards the next level of evolution is, is by converging our religious energies. We need to move from self-reflection to co-reflection. We need a new zest for life. I do think Pope Francis in the encyclical Laudato Si is a step in the right direction. Laudato Si is sort of a call for planetization. And we're almost there. You know, I want to call up Pope Francis and say, Pope Fra Frank, we're almost there, you know. But we need, to, we need to, in a sense, let go of some of these structures that hold us back from really engaging in a new way. You know, inviting world religions into a new, a new community of being together for a new world. So Tara says, you know, it's not, about, it's not about information, you know, it's not about what you know, it is heart to heart. Love energy at the core of the universe is ultimately what binds us together. And we know that when we meet an other, whoever that other is, whatever that other believes, when we meet that person heart to heart, we are one. And so Teilhard thought that we need to find a new evolutionary role for religions. And he says this means a new form of worship and a new method of action. A new form of worship and a new method of action. What might that look like for us? Can we imagine what that might be? He says all religions, all religions must have faith in humanity. Do we believe in ourselves? Do we believe in this human community? Faith in the world. Do we believe that the world can be and is love energy? Faith in the future. The very thing I think that we so fear is what Teilhard says we are to have faith in. So he calls us to a new mysticism. He calls us to a new spiritual direction. Communion with God or with the one or with that core of ultimacy in your life. Communion with the earth and communion with God through the earth. And those three levels, it's involution, what draws me to a deeper sense of personhood and unity. Communion outward, what draws me to use my talent and my gifts for this world. And, and communion with the earth, what draws us together. This is second axial period consciousness. And I think that's why Teilhard sometimes is misinterpreted. We, we, we tend to interpret him from the first axial period, and he is writing out of a more integrated, a higher level of consciousness. Um, and therefore, he's asking us to come together for the sake of the whole, gathering the energies of sacred and secular. He was actually drawn to, you know, some aspects of the secular, for Marxism, you know, that kind of, that hands-on, get-involved thing. A new religion of the world, a new religion of the earth. And he thought Christianity should, in a sense, lead the way not from a point of superiority, but from a point of kenosis. Not from saying, hey, we're the, we're the real religion, but from a self-emptying in love and inviting others into that love. That, he says, can lead to a positive world-oriented spirituality to sustain human effort. So. I would say this, I think interreligious dialogue based on doctrine or religious experience alone is too narrow, too small in light of Teilhard. You know, we've been doing this for now a while, and even interreligious dialogue has a little bit waned. You know, we don't invite everyone to the tea parties anymore. Evolution demands a new religion. We need to think, we need to be able to let go, to trust that God is at the heart of this process, that there is love, you know, pulling us onward and move towards a new religion of humankind and the earth. To develop a zest for life, a zest. I mean, I look around and everyone looks exhausted, including myself, you know. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh yeah, a zest, you know. I mean, does religion instill in us a zest for a new humanity, a zest for a new earth? 
we're like, oh, that's a nice idea, you know, yeah, let's plan a, let's plan a garden, you know. But his, like a new religion of the earth, means living from the inner depths, right? I think we're exhausted because our inner depths are thinned out. So it is an age that is calling us to a new depth of a mystical life, a new depth of a new level of consciousness. Teilhard's view is this, none of the traditions alone, no religious tradition alone can achieve this type of planetary consciousness and unification of humankind. Three words, converge, evolve, or perish. And that's, in a sense, the threshold where we find ourselves today. We must find re within religious traditions the power for a new level of heart and mind. Because what Teilhard says is without that spiritual energy, that core energy, all other systems are stifled. All other systems, whether it's economics or politics or, or cultures themselves, they cannot go forward because the core energy is not liberated for something more. So, Teilhard's universal Christ, the grand option is to choose life. It was the symbol that he knew. And, you know, let's face it, we, we are always, in a sense, somewhat circumscribed by our, our limited subjective perspectives, right? I can only see the world out of my eyes. I cannot see it from, you know, some, someone others. But his, his Christ is the whole. And, and in that whole, he saw a place for all world religions to gather into a stream of flowing consciousness, of flowing life, because all religions are in evolution. And we are being summoned at this moment to a new level of humanity, a new earth, a new religion of the earth. And in Teilhard's view, we will all be saved, we will be saved all together, as a whole, or not at all. Thank you. We'd love to do some questions, and John and I are then going to make a response as well from the point of view of Eastern religions and Western religions. But let's start with some questions, shall we? Absolutely. Yeah, and make your questions short, please, so we get everybody to say something. I believe there's a microphone, so let's wait for the microphone, too. And if, uh, if I have to, I'll come and take the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> Panikar, and I think, you know, Cynthia's here and, and others, you know, I think Panikar's cosmotheandrism is very complementary to what Teilhard is calling the universal Christ. In other words, there is this complexification of divinity, humanity, and cosmos, you know, and it works as a whole. And I think Panikar offers that, I would say, the mystical dimension of Teilhard's evolutionary vision. Um, so, you know, I think Ursula King just published uh, an article or a Teilhard studies on cosmotheandrism where she actually uh, compares Teilhard and Panikar. So I might maybe urge you to, to, uh, to read Ursula's essay. But, but Teilhard clearly is a cosmotheandric thinker. In other words, you cannot really think about God apart from, you know, materiality, nor can you even think about us apart from God and materiality. You know, there's this like perichoresis. It's the trinitization, you might say, of divinity, uh, created reality, and uh, evolution. Okay, uh, Richard in the back, and then here. Yep. Thanks, Ilya. Uh, 1975 would have been the 30th anniversary of the creation of the UN. Do you have an attribution for your, your, your reference? Thank you. 1975, it's the UNESCO meeting, yes, at the United Nations in 1975. 
And um, the passage itself can be found in the article by Ewart Cousins, who attended that meeting. Yeah. Great. Right here? Oh, OK. Back there. Christ means anointing. Oil touches us. And in Genesis 2-7, we're touched by the hands of God. We're fashioned by the Yatsar. And we're kissed by the breath of God. I'm just wondering about the elemental reality of touch as we're experiencing it now, being a new language of conversion. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. I mean, um, and I think that's true. You know, Teilhard did not... Um, talk so much in the language of sacramentality, but uh, that grace, love, love energy was important. So touch, and of course, his famous thing of seeing, you know, so the, the use of the senses to be, and, and that to me is a, a level of consciousness, right? That uh, as I experience, you know, I experience the, the moreness, the depth, uh, the breath, the something that's pulling me, you know, and that pull, that experience then, you know, I'd say is then fashioned into this understanding of the Christic, you know, the emerging Christic. But yeah, the use of sense is important for him. Great. Over here? Uh, the other way, the other way. Yeah. I appreciate your comments about the relationship of Teilhard's thought to Eastern religions. I'm wondering if you could say anything about the relation of Teilhard's thought to indigenous religions where I have the impression there's a more lively relationship between materiality and spirit. Oh yeah, we have an expert here there on, on indigenous religions. As far as I know, Teilhard did not have familiarity with indigenous religions. I think he would have been really drawn to them, quite honestly, um, because of that you know, spirit in nature, that, that deep unification of spirit and materiality. But I don't know, of, I don't know you, John, if, you know, if, if he ever had any contact with like, Native Americans or any primal spiritualities, even around the globe. But I think that would be very consonant with his vision. Yeah. I think this is a, a, a moment. And let's go back to questions, so we're not done. But Mary Evelyn, would you say a word here uh, about, say, uh, some agendas in, in response? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So don't go away. Um, okay. So we love Teilhard. But Teilhard, as um, Ilya referenced, did not understand. Eastern religions, he really didn't. And we like to call them Asian religions now. And having spent 10 years here at Columbia studying Asian religions, um, it's actually painful to hear Teilhard's characterization of Asian religions as escaping the world, as non-material. Um, and also South Asia, Indian religions, Hinduism and Buddhism are completely different than East Asian religions of Confucianism and Taoism. And we've spent the last 20 years trying to bring forward the world's religions for their contribution and their activation just along the lines that Teilhard was calling for. So there's tremendous movement in these religions to respond to the ecological crisis. But I just, and then John can make um, his response, but Confucianism is one of the most embodied religions in the world. Their cosmology is heaven, earth, and human. The human completes the cosmos. The human is the mind and heart of the universe. Chi is matter energy, very similar to spirit and matter of Teilhard. If you're doing Tai Chi or Qi Gong, you're cultivating the Chi of the universe. This is a completely immanently powerful tradition. So is Taoism. Taoism is all about the microcosm of the self to the macrocosm of the universe, the relationality um, to the natural world, and so on. Teilhard had no idea, and the great Confucian scholars that we study with and are still in contact with in China are very regretful that although he lived for a long time, he didn't study these traditions. And it's not just because he was a scientist. There were no translations. I spent 25 years doing one translation of a Japanese Confucian text. The language barrier around East Asia for, Confu for these traditions of Chinese, of Japanese, and so on, are immense. We have more translations from the South Asian world because the English and German scholars were there. But we just did an interview yesterday with one of the leading scholars of India 
on bhakti that John may elaborate on, which is the largest religious uh, school in India, devotionalism, to the living world, to trees, rivers, plants, animals, and so on. This interview is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. So in John, we'll certainly elaborate on that. We could talk about Zen as very indigenized with the gardens and so on and so forth. So the point is, I mean, Ursula, the, I mean, the point that Ilya is trying to make, Teilhard might have made his same points without understanding these traditions, but we've got to not, I think, repeat the distortions of Teilhard about these traditions because it's not, it's not helpful to the traditions, it's not helpful for what, where we want to go. But, John, would you like to say something about... I'd like to hear Ilya. Yeah. Too. Okay. Um, and then let's have more questions. Okay. Yeah, I think in response to that, and I think that, I think, you know, absolutely what you're saying, Mary Evelyn, I think with Teilhard, and maybe this is the p part I would just like to highlight here, so while the Eastern religions, I mean, the beauty, the richness, clearly, what Teilhard was emphasizing was future. In other words, the historicity of Western Christianity posits that um, history becomes something. There's change, there's development, there's future, and there's creativity which um, he didn't see in the Eastern religions. And so what I would say is this, I think you need both. And, and this is, I think what we're seeing here, and I don't think he would be opposed to this. We need, but we need, he should, I mean, he could have learned more. The richness of these traditions are, can absolutely lead to a deepened spiritual energy of the earth. But what he's saying is that this earth is becoming something. Yeah. And what is it becoming? So okay. you need, it's, it is the yin and the yang. So Sri Aurobindo in yes. India had a very consonant view of Tehar. You see that it's an evolving universe, that spirit and matter are evolving together. This is a great Indian thinker. So first of all, we can't say Eastern religions. They simply are not one. He's saying right. all the Eastern religions simply wanted the human to escape from the earth. That is so like not most, true. Yeah. Confucianism is committed to education, to politics, to the family, to the world. Completely committed to this world. My point is, we can't group them together. South Asia and East Asia are very, very different. And in all these traditions, we have an imminental sensibility, profound. And indigenous. Now we have microphone for more questions. Ilya, you're doing such a good job. Yes. <laughs> Kate. Go ahead. I know you're teaching young people now. Presumably many of them are Catholic. And the young people that I'm familiar with uh, do not come with this uh, Catholic tradition that a lot of us here might come from. I actually see a lot of lack of interest. And I was just wondering what you, I don't know, what you say to them, or if someone says to you, where do I go from here? I'm not, I'm Catholic, but it really doesn't mean anything to me. Where, where yeah. do these people go? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think with uh, the millennial generation, I think we see kind of what Terry might call a secular, you know, the secular religion, uh, the religious energies now in the secular realm. Um, so you find a lot of people, you know, uh, not interested in institution of religion, but they are interested in, in the earth. They are interested in the poor, in immigration. So they are deeply invested, and, and they are very, I find young people very uh, oriented toward community. So the, I think there's a great hope in younger generations for the kind of new religion of the earth that Teilhard anticipated. Um, and I think we need to do a better job of, of understanding uh, Christianity within this new framework. I mean, we kind of give it, you know, I think it's just waking up, but it needs a whole new uh, reorientation. I think the theology, some of the theology is old. You know, I have, I have 18 and 19 year olds who are still talking about Adam and Eve and apples and, you know, garden and sin. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, where'd you get this from? It's like my grandmother taught me, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we need to do a better job of, of bringing, you know, people up to a deeper understanding that this religion is not so superficial. You know, I think, and no religion is superficial. I think that's what we're saying. Religion is the depth, the depth of what, you know, what we are, that core energy. Um, and I think theology needs a lot of work in terms of, you know, uh, Christianity getting up to speed with uh, an evolutionary universe. Yeah. 
Yeah. Maria, over here. Yeah. Does the Maria, get, get the does the exploration uh, in the field of quantum physics of, about the term entanglement, I, for me that seems yeah. to resonate very strongly, it's very yeah. exciting, and I'd love to read more and more and more about right. the theological Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, again, um, Teilhard doesn't reference entanglement in his writings, but I wondered if his own thinking um, was not, in a sense, influenced by some of the new findings in physics, uh, quantum physics, like quantum entanglement, where there's, there's this deep interconnect, you know, that, you know, there's this overlapping of fields that even if you split things apart, you know, they can impact and influence one another. Uh, and I think if we were to think about a new religion of the earth in terms of the world religions, we might think in terms of quantum entanglement and implicate order. That, you know, as David Bohm says, you know, on this outer level, we seem separate. But in our cosmic roots, we all share in the same cosmic process. And that's why all religions must, they must be open to the insights from modern science. Because in a sense, physics, quantum physics, as well as evolution are telling us something about ourselves. And religion is telling us about that core energy of ourselves. And together, I think science and religion can, you might say, help, uh, help us shape a new vision for moving forward. Jose in the back. Paul, Paul, Paul. Jose in the back. You're next. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just had a question about um, if Tabar gave us a method or a practical structure for devising a plan for calling the world religions. Yeah. And having Christians <laughs> as leaders in Tabar's vision call others without sounding patronizing. Yeah. You know, I didn't. I don't find Taylor an overly practical guy, quite honestly. You know, I, I find him like a a broad visionary. Um, but he did take part in um, the World Congress of Religions uh, several times. So, you know, I guess in his age, in his day, that would have been an effort to uh, sort of embody and enkindle this new vision by speaking about the need for world religions and and Christianity to harness their energies in a new way. But he didn't have too many practical or concrete points about, you know, what would be the next steps here. So. Jose. Yeah, he was okay. okay. Yeah, I love this vision. Uh, whatever happened to evil and sin. Yeah. So if I use um, Teilhard's language, you know, and, and Ken, again, this is another critique of Teilhard, right? He, he speaks about evil as a structural necessity of a world that's in evolution. In other words, given the very large, you know, um, uh, dimensions of this cosmos, there will be, in a sense, bad things that happen. Now, I think I, I would like to maybe um, delineate that a little bit. I think on the level of a very large universe, you know, where the whole thing is in the process of formation. In other words, this is not, this whole thing is not over and done with. And that's what we have to get in our heads. It is a, it's a process. In other words, the whole thing is in evolution. Now, there will be, uh, there will be deaths, there will be, you know, there will be bad things that happen. Uh, but I think on the human level, quite honestly, we can choose against evolution. We can we can destroy life, we can destroy uh, relationships, and therefore we can choose against that love energy that can evolve us. Um, Teilhard doesn't talk about that too much. I, I think one could infer it maybe from his own you know, large view, but he doesn't spend a lot of time on sin and evolution. Sin, he says, the flip side of sin is creative union. That when we, you know, when we fall down or, or choose against the good, there's something in us that keeps looking for ways to move beyond, you know, to get up again, to go forward. And that's why he sees that there's something at the heart of life that's, that's not love versus, you know, good versus evil or love versus something else. It's love alone. And there's that core energy, you know, when all fails, all's destroyed, we get up again and, and we, you know, awake to a new day with hope. And the whole of Teilhard's vision is one of hope and promise. Thanks. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, 
The Telegraph's view on evolutionary convergence implied uh, a cultural, a, a loss of cultural and biological diversity. I'm wondering if that was the case. Yeah. And, and if so, uh, you know, how did he right. stood with respect to, uh, you know, the mainstream Darwinian views on diversity and speciation? Yeah, I would just say the opposite, actually. And I say that, you know, it can seem like this kind of vanilla blending, or what we, what we are seeing today, the westernization of the entire world, you know, uh, where everyone wants to be like an American or something, and that's not what Teilhard actually thought, I think. Uh, even his views on, you know, on world religions was the rich diversity of the spiritual paths, you know, you might say, coming together into a new level of humankind. So, his famous maxim is union differentiates. The more we are in union with another, the more we become ourselves because it's the core of ourselves that's the basis of union. And I would take that both on the level of the person or the individual as well as the level of the various religions or the various cultures. And we have, we have lost sight. And so I don't think for Teilhard it's the Darwinian of the best culture wins out, you know, or the best economy wins. And that's been our downfall, quite honestly, is because we don't have a, a consciousness of evolving together, that we have this sense of domination. And what we don't find in Teilhard is the sense of domination and power. We're the best religion. You know, we're the, we're the number one economy. We're the number one world. He's like, no, it's planetization. It's we're all in this together. And so how do we harness, I love that word, harness, the best of what we are for the newness of what we can be. And in that harnessing, we become truly who we are in our cultures, our languages, even our religions. I don't think he saw this kind of blending together. Okay, let's move up. I'm wondering if uh, traditionally we think of sort of uh, mystical wisdom masters as having cultivated an ascetic or monastic practice of meditation to achieve a certain degree of vision and enlightenment, like we see in they are. Um, or Pete Griffiths, for example, who's yep. all in wonder of nature led him to that ascetic path. Right. And I'm wondering if you have any sense of Teilhard's history in terms of prayer discipline. Did he have any of these sort of traditional prayer practices and meditation, or if really it was just an awe and wonder of his childhood with matter that graced him with this yeah. larger vision that he cultivated over life. Yeah, well, you know, okay, he was a Jesuit, so he was steeped in the Ignatian exercises, and they do, in a sense, frame a lot of his thoughts and spirituality, but he was also in the desert for a long time. You know, you don't have to go to, he didn't have to go to a monastery because he was really in the midst, he didn't have a shopping mall, he didn't have a telephone. I mean, he didn't have all the modern conveniences distracting him. He, he was living in sort of an exile in the desert. So I, I think of Teilhard sort of as a modern desert father. You know, he's, he's there in the desert, he's, he's engaged in his research work, and he's deeply, you know, he's thinking deeply about these matters of spirit and becoming and future and evolving. Um, and so, you know, his prayers uh, can be devotional. I mean, you know, he prays, he has a great devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. But again, this, that great devotion to the heart of Jesus is this like fire of love at the heart of the cosmos. He was definitely unique. You know, he definitely brought together in his own person those, those strands of deep Ignatian, uh, even Catholic spirituality, and yet this this deep love of the earth, as you indicate, you know, love, love of science, yeah. yeah over, over here. Yeah. I'm just wondering, if one of the first things that you said that distinguishes Teilhard, I believe, is that his focus is not on the individual, but on the cosmos. But what I'm wondering is, to me, when I hear you speak about Terry, it almost seems like the flip side of Don Scotus and his notion of individuation and the particular the, uh, cosmos being contained and the divine being contained in the particular. Yeah. And I wonder if Terry read Don Scotus yeah. and whether um, do you believe that they are that uh, Don Scotus theology is compatible with uh, right. Right. 
So, so SCOTUS, so, yes, Ewart would love the question. So SCOTUS, I mean, Teilhard discovered SCOTUS rather late in life from a Sicilian Franciscan by the name of Father Allegra. And when he discovered SCOTUS, he said, there it is. There is the theology of the future. In other words, this, this SCOTUS' this notion of the primacy of Christ, that whether or not sin ever existed, Christ would have come, because the Christ is uh, an expression of divine love. It's not depend the Christ is not dependent on the fallenness of the world. So I always say, if, if Teilhard had found SCOTUS earlier, he would have been Teilhard OFM, you know, instead of Teilhard SJ. And I think the Franciscans would have published his works. And, and I'm sure. We do those things. So yes, there's a great compatibility between Scotistic and the notion of hecteitas, the thisness. In other words, God's love is so immeasurable, this divine love so incomprehensible, that this love is the, the breathing life of every single thing that exists. So it's not the analogy of being like, you know, I can just substitute you for you or this acorn for this acorn. It's rather this acorn is loved from all eternity by divine love into the immensity of its fullness. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, tell me when you want to talk. Yeah, I'm, yeah. You just let me know. I'm ready. To, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm having fun. <laughs> You know, I think that the, the, the challenge here is what does it mean for any religious tradition to remain true to its authentic core? I think that's the question. While at the same time, um, allowing that tradition to become compatible, resonated with it, a world in evolution. And here I think sometimes we, we are at this level of, we come together, right? We talk, you know, we, we exchange, no aetate, you know, God can be revealed in other religions. But at the heart of it, at this level, we're not changing our theologies. You know, we're not changing our salvation theories. We're not changing what we think is, you know, the final say for the individual here. So we're not thinking cosmically. And I think, so what Teilhard says, he doesn't begin here, like let's get together and talk about religion. He begins here. Here is our home, the universe. Here is our world, the planet, the earth. This is where we be, this is the starting point for our coming together. We, we start on the level up, we're starting here, he wants us to start down here. And that, I think if we were to do that, if we were to come together and start on the level, this planet is our home together. This universe is our origin, our story, together. What does it mean now to be on mission in the, this planet, in this universe, together? What is our future together? And how do our religious traditions, our spiritualities, empower us for our future together? Rather than, oh, oh, that's a good creed. I like your creed, you know, I like my, and here's our creed, and we'll exchange creeds, you know, or we'll, you know, what do you do when you go to work, worship? Well, we do this. Oh, good, we do this. And then we go home, you know, and nothing about us really ever changes. We're sort of like, we make new friends, but we never really transform our religious traditions from within. He's asking us for an openness, and I would say kenosis, not only for Christians, I think every religion, you know, it's, it's a, it's a self-emptying for a greater fullness. Charter movement as a container potentially for this 
convergence and how is it actually playing out? Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, I mean, there's been a lot. Look, I think, you know, what John and Mary Evelyn have been doing at Yale, I mean, that's fantastic work. And I think it really is the seedbed of planetization. And I think, I think here's maybe what I see as a Western phenomenon. And we're, we're a little bit pragmatic and, and we're a little bit, we want to solve the problems of the world. You know, we want to solve the problem. No, I'm not saying that's what you do at Yale. That's what we do at Villanova, actually. You know, we want to solve problems because that's a Western, that's a Western mentality. We're very pragmatic. And I think we do need something of the East, quite honestly. We need a harnessing of spiritual energy. So I think Earth Charter does provide, you might say, the blueprint. Here's what, you know, we can work together toward. But to do that, not in an overly pragmatic way, but first harnessing our spiritual power, our spiritual energies, which means our religions need to be on board with this charter and not just simply working out of isolated corners, you know? Yes, do you have? Well, they, they, yeah, I mean, these are the experts here. I'm just popping in for a lecture. No, no, so. no, 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 no. <laughs> you're, you're, you're translating, you're teaching. Um, but Deborah's question is, is important because yeah, the good. conferences at Harvard 20 years ago, starting 95 to 98, um, to be celebrated this fall at Harvard, the 20th anniversary, but at every conference on exploring the world's religions, their views of nature, their understandings of our embeddedness in this world, um, had the Earth Charter in its draft form as part of the conference, so the various religious uh, scholars and theologians were, were responding to that. Um, and what we're trying to do as well is in this dialogical way that, that uh, Ilya is speaking about is take journey of the universe also into that dialogical conversation with the world's religion. So that's why we did living cosmology so the Christian traditions could respond to what is this huge uh, evolving universe. The other religions as well, just as Ilya has said, the science religion dialogue is critical. It's got to be in relation to this you know, large and evolving universe. And believe me, around the world, this is very vital. You know, we're showing Journey in the Science Museum in Seoul. We've just come back from Iran to a conference with the Iranian government, the Department of the Ministry of Environment, UNEP. UNESCO was all about the world's religions, their views of nature, and so on. This is a desert area, Iran and the Middle East. And we went in 2001, 2005, Hatami, the president, said, we're not concerned about terrorism. We're concerned about the environment and its future. And our tradition, Islam, and especially the Sufi tradition, but has immense resources. The vice president and minister for the environment who chaired both those conferences is a woman who is a PhD, educated here in the West, profoundly interested in bringing these traditions forward. So it is happening in our time. That's the exciting thing about the Teardian message. It's happening in our time. The last head of UNEP was a Teardian, Klaus Topfer. A, a German completely gets Teilhard, you see? So it's happening. It doesn't get in the news, but it's happening. <laughs> yeah. Okay, in the back. Yeah. Angela? Hi. Um, I want to go back to something you said about uh, that the religious energy is now on the secular realm. Uh, Teilhard saw religious energies both in the sacred and the secular realms. Well, I would say this, in other words, the spirit, I'm spiritual but not religious, you know, the, the, the famous maxim, is when I, when I think of religion, I think, you know, I don't think of institution, I think of that which is pulling us on towards some type of unity, some type of, you know, something outside of us that's within us that's pulling us towards something more unifying. That could be working towards a community garden. That could be working for the poor together. I think the key is that, you know, what I find today uh, with young people is, what community am I part of? What whole am I part of? And how does my life in participating that whole bring me to a greater level of wholeness? 
And that's, to me, religious. It's the same thing with church. You know, if I gather at a church, you know, that should empower me towards a greater consciousness of wholeness, a greater sense that my personhood is part of a larger, you know, personal community. So that's what I mean by religious there. Yeah. Just a couple more questions. Did you have something else? Did you want to, did you have a thought there? Yeah. I think it's okay. Okay. Oh, Mary Lewis. Just Yeah, I mean, we don't, yeah. But people believe in something, even if you believe, you know, that this earth can become green, or you believe that, you know, poverty can be eradicated. You know, that's a belief in the earth. That's a belief. It's part of what they are It is. It's part of the type of faith. But the other part, she says in that wonderful quote, everywhere on earth in this moment is in the new spiritual path we were created by the idea of evolution. Yeah. Right. right. And so I don't know that the love of God is necessary. Right, and that's the missing. Is that, you know, is that necessary now? I mean, I see so many people without necessarily that uh, orientation just putting their lives on the line. Yeah, exactly. But I think, you know, again, I don't think it needs to be an explicit, I mean, it can or it may not, you know, that explicit love of God. I think, I think we are continuously drawn into, again, using Terry's language, tangential, tangential energy, the energy of being drawn to community, working for a cleaner earth, you know, better earth, uh, uh, eradicating the poor, radial energy. There's something that keeps drawing me beyond myself towards, you know, towards something else. And I think today, quite honestly, uh, that tra- radial energy is, is sometimes supplanted by technology. You know, I can go on Facebook, I can go on social media, I can, you know, find my, but then we realize it's not fulfilling. So I think there is a deep yearning there. Uh, and I think technology is tapping into that deep transcendent yearning, but it can't quite fulfill it. And so we need a repackaging of God. Thank you. Yeah, over here. Maybe. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up to that comment there, too. You know, I was thinking about that with the earlier comment about young people and you know, not being comfortable with this split of God, God talk and spirituality, and just what you said now. And I'm thinking about the role of the arts as, and this whole question about a scientific world of a science that is reduced to just empirical learning rather than open, a more openness that religions have had, and that the arts can open people. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. In fact, you know, in some ways, I think Teilhard was sort of a right brain scientist, you know. I mean, he was logically, he was analytical, but he had a sense of connectivity, passion, freedom. You know, I think uh, he was, I don't know if he played music, anyone who might have known Teilhard or, or painted. Did he paint? Do you know if he painted or played music? No, I don't know. Yes, do you know that? But I think that's why he loved Lucille Swan, quite honestly, because she was an artist, and she maybe, you know, drew out that, that artistic dimension of life for him. You know, so if you, don't, if you can't do art, find someone who can, and, you know, <laughs> hook up with them. Maybe a final question. Yeah. In the back. I think the soul is, it's not static. I think the soul that he's talking about is the dynamic energy of evolution that is the energy of continuous unification. So that, so, so we have to, again, we think, we think in static terms. And I think Teilhard is inviting us to think in terms of process and dynamism. That when we talk about this, I mean, just for practical example, let's look at technology again, internet. Right? We are more connected today with a new level of consciousness than ever before. I mean, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, religious pluralism or, you know, even traveling to Iran or Iraq would have been like, oh my gosh, really? Now we have a touch of a button and we have a, an awareness of what's happening around the world. So soul has been actually evolving in some ways through this level of the new sphere or the mind. But now Tara is saying that it, it's not quite only on the mind. We need now a heart-to-heart. 
And that's the type of soul that will continue, I think, to emerge if, re if religions, if we can converge our spiritual energies, our religious energies, into a new sense of belonging to the earth together. We will come to love one another, I think, together on a new level. I think that's, that's great. Um, can, can we continue with, with Ursula? With Ursula. with Ursula King and Ilya Dilio are on my mind. Um, but I just want to say one thing, and I really, really want to thank Ilya. You know, this is just such a great afternoon. I, I want to affirm the work of so many people in this room, but I want to just also respond to that question about the arts. You know, we've got a Journey of the Universe Oratorio. We've got Imogene Drummond doing a film. We've got uh, Jennifer Morgan doing Deep Time Network. We have a lot of artists, Angela included, um, doing amazing work in music, in the arts, um, et cetera. It's why we did Journey of the Universe in, in a form that will appeal. It's also why, to some of your questions about young people, we didn't overtly mention God. But it's infused with the sense of the divine milieu. So we need all these strategies. We need to appeal to a younger generation where that language might not appeal. We need a catholicity of an evolving universe, a new series that, that Ilya is, is editing. We need to bring the Catholic tradition and the Christian traditions on board. And in particular, though, and this is where I think the dialogue will definitely go on, the other world religions, again, we can't put them all together in a bundle and say they're escapism, the Asian religions, etc. We've got to respect not, and I loved what Ilya was saying. You know, it's just not like, let's get together, your worship is different. I mean, we've been in interreligious dialogue forever. But as we understand what these traditions are saying and invite them into this cosmic perspective that Ilya is bringing all of us into even further, that's where the convergence will come. The cosmological dimensions of all the world's religions and their valuing of ecology and humans is where it will go together. John will have the last word come along. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Evelyn, for the invitation. And Ilya, what a delight. And uh, let me return to that delight. I want to ask all of you to take up a small chore, if you would, those of you who can. Uh, we are in a very gracious space. Union Theological Seminary has been very gracious to the American Teilhard Association in accommodating our needs this year, but actually every year they extend the space to us without charge. If it's possible, please take a moment and send a small brief note of thanks to President Serene Jones at Union Theological Seminary on behalf of the American Teilhard Association. It's a small act and not an obligation that I want to put on you, but simply a request. And we have to have one more round of applause for Tara and the students and Paul. Thank you so much. Ilya? One of the activities that I find missing in our times is a, a sense of uh, ritualizing what passes for mundane. Uh, in these types of occasions, there's uh, what is called an honorarium. And it's a transmission of the resources of, of an institution or of a group of people to someone who has given of their heart to us. And, I wanted to take this occasion also to be transparent to you that there is a sense of deep thanks on the part of all of us today and this cannot express all of our thanks but it is one way of saying from uh, our uh, hands to your hands, from our heart to your heart, thank you so much. Gracias. I just want to say...
it's not, it's not unwilling, but I also would like to visit your expenses for time. Yeah, it's looking good. Next year, 50th anniversary, John Grimm. Come again and join the association. Just go to the uh, website, there, Dr. Bennett. Please join. Uh, thank you, Ilya. Thank each one of you again and again. Thomas Berry spoke about the great work, and I think the great work is emerging with this vision and the work you're doing. Thank you so much. I thought I got the last one. <laughs>